Hey everyone, welcome back to the Couples Therapist Couch. This is Shane Burkle, and today I am speaking with Dr. Bill Doherty. Hi, Bill. Welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Shane. Thank you. Yeah, for those who don't know, uh, Bill is a leader in the world of couples and family therapy and is the founder of Discernment Counseling for Couples on the Brink of Divorce. And um, so some of the what we're going to talk about today is the tension between marriage as a permanent committed relationship and a venue for personal happiness, which is what um, discernment counseling kind of kind of stems from. But um, before we get to that, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Yeah, well, I've been at this a while. I went to graduate school in the early 70s, and I've been reflecting now about how early that was in the development of couples therapy and family therapy. Uh, and <clears throat> my uh, initial work was with teens and their parents, so family therapy, doing a lot of uh, structural family therapy. And I got into couples therapy because what I discovered was a lot of times couples' problems were underlying their teens' problems. And um, the team would, would get better, and then the marital issues would come out. Uh, and I sometimes thought that the teens were actually uh, dropping their parents off at the therapist's door, you know, that the, that the kids often got better after a few sessions uh, and were just delighted to have their parents continue to, you know, work on their, their marital and couple problems. So. Right. Uh, so I, um, I just, you know, I started out doing families and then I ended up with couples and um, probably some of your readers have had the same experience that, that at some point, then that's who comes to see you, right? That that's uh, your, your practice sort of picks you uh, as uh, people who are satisfied with your services, refer others. And then all of a sudden I realized at some point, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly a couples therapist, but it wasn't that I started out that way. Yeah. And I love that, you know, as family therapists, it is um, such an integral part of what we do that um, we look at the whole family system. And, um, you know, I think people often, you know, I think a lot of us have had that experience where we have people bring their children in for therapy and uh, I don't know about you, but it, it feels very difficult to to help sometimes unless the parents are going to be very involved in the process. Right, right. And and I never regret the family systems orientation because I think that really helps with couples therapy. It helps with understanding co-parenting dynamics. Uh, it's particularly helpful working with remarried couples and step families with all this sort of loyalty binds and that kind of thing. So anyway, that's how I got going. And I, <clears throat> I uh, ended up teaching in medical schools for a number of years, uh, just sort of by happenstance, and then um, um, began to see the role of uh, chronic medical illness in couple and family problems, um, helped to start an area called medical family therapy, uh, and um, uh, and so became much more sensitized to the role of, if you will, biology and illness in couples and family relationships. Um, and uh, a along the way, uh, uh, like many people, began to see this challenge of of working with with uh, couples on the brink of divorce, uh, where somebody is leaning out of the marriage and ambivalent about doing therapy, and the other is gung ho to save it. Uh, and like many other therapists, I walked into that challenge, uh, didn't, and not, not, not succeeding much, and then developed a, a, a kind of a special way to work with those couples uh, called discernment counseling. Yeah, and in order to kind of set up the conversation, I, I love, uh, I've heard you speak at the um, Networker Symposium, and um, you sent me the chapter to read, but I love the way that you talk about how society influences us as um, couples and family therapists. And I think that specifically for couples on the brink of divorce, you know, uh, I would love to hear you speak to the last several decades and how the changes in society make it more and more difficult for couples to feel uh, like they, like they know what to do in their relationships. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, 
a, a big picture out there about uh, marriage and couple relationships. And let me just say, when I say marriage here, I'm really going to be talking about people who've made a lifetime commitment to each other. Okay, great. Um, and um, wh whatever gender or so on. Um, the, you know, we, we, um, we define marriage as this permanent lifelong commitment. And, you know, and th that's why people, um, you know, travel across the country or the world, spend a lot of money to go to the wedding of a friend in a way that they don't do that to when their friend moves in with somebody. Mm -hmm, right. right. Uh, so um, uh, because this, this moment represents a promise um, uh, you know, better, worse, richer, or poorer, uh, and um, and it's uh, validated by the state. And to go out, get out of it, you have to get a, you have to get, go through the state again. So it's you know, it's 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 a bigger deal than just having an intimate relationship. You can have an intimate relationship anytime, um, but uh, to marriage represents something uh, bigger. Um, and, um, and, you know, and historically, uh, it was very hard to get out of a marriage. Um, and, um, uh, you know, in, in fact, in, in uh, English law and in the American colonies, um, in many of the American colonies, you, you had to get a, a, a bill introduced into the legislature to get a divorce. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so it was, um, uh, you know, as, but not that marriages didn't break up. People walked out. They abandoned. They did other sorts of things. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, we, but in the, certainly since the 20th century and particularly since the mid 20th century, uh, we've really had this tension uh, in the culture between marriage as a venue for personal happiness and marriage as a lifelong committed relationship. Uh, marriage historically was more of an economic um, child rearing institution. You didn't go into it. Um, you, you hope to be happy, but that's that's not that wasn't the goal. Um, and then it shifted uh, into uh, what we have now with a lot of young people. It's you're supposed to marry your soulmate and be, you know, and in the fairy tale live happily ever after. Uh, mm -hmm. So we now have this tension, and this tension between individual happiness and let's say from a psych, from a therapist point of view, individual well-being uh, and uh, commitment has been there, this tension since the beginning of marriage counseling, what we now call couples therapy, which really started in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and, um, and we've never adequately addressed that in the field. Um, we just we just haven't. Uh, it has been uh, an underground thing, um, and uh, so part of what I've been interested in my career uh, since the 1980s, uh, when I read this uh, monumental book called uh, Habits of the Heart by Robert Bella and others, which is subtitled Individualism and Commitment in American Life. Um, I, I've been kind of on this question of how as therapists do we uh, think about um, commitment versus individual happiness, autonomy, well-being, which comes up for us as couples therapists when somebody is seriously considering divorce. It doesn't come up so much if you have a couple coming in and they, you know, they're, they're in conflict, they're in stress, in distress, but then they want to work on their relationship. Well, this issue doesn't come up then because both people are kind of in, they're in to work on it. Mm -hmm. And our models of couples therapy are based on that, that kind of couple. The studies are based on people who are interested in working on the relationship. But we do, we know that there's a, there's a, a subset of couples who come to see us where somebody is not sure they want to work on the relationship. They're, they're leaning out, they're demoralized, and they may be showing up, but they're, they're not really in. Uh, they're not completely out. Uh, and there, I'm really saying, we have not prepared uh, couples therapists um, for how to walk with people through that dilemma. Um, and I want to add, although mostly we're talking about couples therapy here, it's even it's much more so for individual therapists because people go to individual therapists a lot for the relationship problems. 
Mm -hmm. And they bring this dilemma there. So the whole field of therapy, psychotherapy, uh, has not really, I don't think, dealt very explicitly and consciously and thoughtfully with this, this issue of personal goals, personal happiness, and marital commitment. Yeah, and I've, I've talked to couples therapists who speak about how if uh, one of the partners is an individual therapy, that can often be at odds with what they're trying to do in the work with couples therapy because it's like individual empowerment versus relational empowerment. That's right. And um, th this is a big problem. And again, we don't talk about it very much, right? We don't, we don't have workshops on this. Uh, there's not much written about this, but everybody who does couples therapy knows that it can be really dicey when somebody is seeing an individual therapist who is thoroughly on their side. Um, so I see it all the time where the individual therapist is basically an advocate for a divorce. Um, they're saying, um, you know, um, you've done all you can, um, and, um, and, and, and why is it you think you're staying, um, given what you're dealing with in your recalcitrant spouse? And, and you're as a couples therapist, you've got them both in the room, and you believe that, you're, that both of them are contributing to the problems. So you, you don't have somebody who has thoroughly has their act together and the other not. Um, and that's a serious undermining of, of couples therapy. Right. Yeah, and I, and I love the way you're framing the conversation because um, it's very easy to imagine this in our, well, whether it's our own relationships or whether it's the people we work with, this reality that I can't have everything I want and feel totally happy um, while at the same time working with my partner and my family and dealing with all these other human beings who, are, who I feel close to. So I want to be loyal to them, but I also want to get what I, what I want and need for myself as an individual in my life. And it feels very overwhelming and confusing for people who have lived with this, you know, usually by the time they get to us for years and feeling like they can't, they can't even figure out how to get um, all of these things at, at the same time. Yes. And of course they come to us in a cultural moment and we are in that cultural moment. And that's so some of what I write and talk about is that a prior cultures, I mean, you go back to the 19th, early 20th century in the U S had um, a cultural ethic that you stay no matter what. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's uh, horribly toxic, even if you're abused and person is cheating on you continually. So uh, there, was, there was that cultural time, which uh, none of us want to go back to. But along with the, the, the social movements of the 60s and 70s, we entered a different cultural era, which is uh, much more of a me-focused era. You know, the, the uh, m m many of our models of couples therapy, in fact, you know, came of age in the 1970s, uh, which uh, has been labeled the me decade. And so, um, so we now have a culture uh, in which the self uh, is seen as most important. Um, and uh, what, I, what I call the consumer self, okay, uh, uh, that my, my, my job in life is to maximize my personal well-being, my self-esteem, my experiences, uh, and that, uh, and that uh, the, 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 the marriage then becomes a venue uh, for me to uh, meet my personal needs and uh, to be happy. Uh, and, and of course, that's, that's partly true. I mean, that's, you know, that's, we don't need marriage anymore as just for economic survival. Um, but the, we live in a, a consumer culture where, um, you know, Nike tells us just, just do it. Okay. Where, um, you know, Toyota says it's your turn now. I remember this ad, you know, this, uh, you've given so much for the kids, you've sacrificed for the kids. It's your turn now, you know, mm -hmm. get, get this car. So we live in a consumer culture where uh, the, the, not so subliminal messages, you're number one and you're entitled, you're entitled to get your needs met. Uh, and uh, that I believe has carried over into 
marriage and family relationships uh, and, and in a way that has made the idea of uh, permanent commitment um, uh, just m more fragile. And so what I'm saying is that as, th as couples therapists, um, I think we have to understand the cultural soup we're all in, uh, that yeah. our clients come in the door. I remember one uh, woman saying about her marriage, this isn't, th this isn't the deal I thought I signed up for, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and then when we have people going to individual therapy, I think individual therapy also emphasizes that so that the discussion of your marital satisfaction is kind of like your, dis your, 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 your discussion of your job. You know, if, if you're tired of your job, if it's not satisfying you anymore, move on. Uh, and that has really kind of invaded the conversation about marital commitment. So it's a big culture. It isn't just, and that we're part of, by the way, that we're a part of, um, and not just this individual in front of us. Yeah, and I think all of us have uh, aspects of both realities, in, you know, within what we want. So for, like you said, none of us want to go back to, people staying in abusive relationships just because you're supposed to stay married for life. And that's the way it is. Um, but there's this part of us who wants to um, just do it for ourselves, you know, get what we want for ourselves. But there's this part of, of us who, especially when you have kids in the situation and everything else who are loyal to our families and want to um, be, uh, sh you know, show up, as a member of our family. And um, so these people show up to our offices feeling just very confused and overwhelmed because they have um, both of these realities that they're trying to live with. Yes, and what I'm arguing is that the cultural pull now is towards self-interest. Okay. Uh, and, if, if, uh, and if we don't do something to challenge and offset that, uh, that's where people will head. Uh, so when I was trained as a couples therapist in the 1970s, what I learned to do with somebody who was considering divorcing versus working on their marriage uh, was to ask the questions only in terms of their self-interest. Um, how would it uh, benefit you to leave? How would it benefit you to stay? What would it cost you to leave? What would it cost you to stay? And back in those days, if somebody brought up that issue you did about the children and somebody said, well, I'm concerned about how the children would fare if I leave the marriage, what, what I was taught to do was to dismiss that, to say, no, 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 is this about you? Is this about your goals? Uh, the children will be fine if you're fine. Uh, okay. And my point is that looking back, um, uh, instead of that being neutral, because that, that's what we think we are being, neutral in that kind of uh, intervention, that is a very value-laden intervention. That, that there's a powerful value that the only um, uh, um, viable consideration is individual self-interest. But at the time, we saw it as neutral. So this is part of the dilemma for a couples therapists and for any therapist uh, dealing with people who are making some decisions about you know, individual goals and, and marital commitment, uh, th th is that we have been uh, trained and socialized to think we have to be neutral in that, uh, in that deliberation. And what I'm saying is that uh, neutrality generally masquerades for uh, enacting the cultural norms of the moment. And oh, if those great. norms are, what do you need to, to do for you? So part of what I say is that <clears throat> in, in individualistic American culture, to ask a client, uh, what, do you, what do you need to do for you now? Um, you know, aside from all that other stuff, what, what, what's, what do you need? Uh, that appears to be a neutral statement, a question. In a more communal culture, that would look to be highly um, value-laden. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, because yeah. it's if it's, it's like it's about you. It's not about the group. It's not about the the family and the tribe. Um, and so uh, I'm a critic of the simplistic. What I see is simplistic. Um, way to deal with this dilemma. The dilemma you and I are talking about now is the is individual fulfillment and 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 relational commitment. Uh, to to say, well, we don't. I don't have to deal with that because my job is to be neutral. Means I think to cop out of the of of the of the fact that that is a value laden conversation, and there is no way to not bring one's values as a therapist into the conversation. I love that. That was great. Uh, it's a good reminder that we we are actually incapable of being unbiased or neutral. And that's a, a good th- uh, thing for us to keep in the back of our mind as we're having these conversations. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that we get to make the decision. Um, I have a colleague who says in these situations that she, she says, I don't get a vote here. Okay. Um, but we are inevitably influential when people are dealing with this. It's really an ethical dilemma. The ethical dilemma is I once made a promise to this person uh, for life to love and honor and cherish sickness and health and so on. I made the promise. This person has presumably made life plans based on that promise that I'm going to be with them. And that's even before we talk about children. Okay, so for me, it isn't just a matter of children. It's not that these promises only matter until the last kid is 18 or, or that they have no children. So, so even taking children out, made that promise. And now, because of pain and lots of things, uh, I'm considering uh, ending the promise. Uh, uh, and then, of course, if there's children, there's other stakeholders, and then we, we go out from there, uh, who are also affected. And the decision to whether, whether to leave or to stay and try to work on it, because that, that's, that's the dilemma that people bring to us as couples therapists. Do I end it now or do I try again? Okay. Do I, do I keep trying? Um, that is an ethical dilemma. That is one of the most important ethical dilemmas that adults face in their lives. And we as therapists are not trained to help people with ethical dilemmas. We, we clinicalize them. We, 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 we dress them up in other language. We think we are neutral on it. Uh, and, um, and, and, and we're not. Uh, uh, and, and then we don't look, we don't examine our own assumptions right? They, they become unexamined because we think we're just being, uh, we're just being neutral. That's great. So I, would this be a good time to move into the conversation of, so what do we, so what do we do with that? What do we do with all that as the therapist? What are, what are some of the ways that we can handle that kind of thing that when it comes into the room? Yeah. So at, at the level of the, uh, of the value orientation, um, what 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 I bring, and I've written about this, is a is a sense that um, absent, uh, you know, compelling reasons otherwise, and that they can compelling reasons can be um, a, a abuse and you know chronic um, infidelity and addictions that the other person will not take responsibility for. In other words, that you don't have somebody, somebody is behaving dysfunctionally. They're, they're undermining <clears throat> the basis of the marriage and they won't take responsibility. They won't work on it. I mean, you know, so at, there are situations in which the marriage becomes unviable. Uh, so just, 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 let's just completely acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the research shows that most marriage, most divorces are not for those reasons. That, that most divorces are for lack of communication, d- difficulty in d- dealing with conflict, arguments about the kids, the money, and so on. Most of them are not for those, what I call the triple A's, the, the chronic affairs, the abuse, and the addictions, which where people won't take responsibility to work on them. So absent uh, kind of uh, toxic, dangerous situations, um, my the value I bring is that it's, generally best for people to see if they can work out their original commitment with this person they once promised 
to, uh, and um, and to uh, to give uh, a th- therapy a shot to mm-hmm. see if they can repair their marriage. Um, looks like my. Can you still hear me? Because it's saying my internet is unstable. You, so am I still here? Oh yeah, you're good. So you okay. Sound good. Okay. So I'll let you know edit. if anything. We can edit that little part out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let okay. you know. If- so I'm going to back up a little bit and repeat yeah. it. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, so my the value actually stand- actually sorry sorry Bill hold on I'm going to make a um a little thing so I can find it on the on the audio track. Okay, go ahead. Right. So the stance that I bring, the value stance I bring is that absent um, certain kinds of uh, toxic, dangerous situations in which it's clear uh, that somebody um, would be compromising their well-being by continuing in the marriage or even to work on the marriage, um, that that I lean towards uh, helping people try to work out their original commitment and to see if they can uh, have personal well-being and the relationship at the same time. In other words, uh, I lean towards repair. Uh, if uh, absent conditions in which it would it would seem um, compromising to somebody's well-being uh, to to attempt to repair. Um, now, having said that, uh, it's their decision, not mine. Um, but I'm not neutral in the way that if somebody is, they've been working in the IT industry for a long time and they're sick of it and they'd like to get into something more human, you know, they'd like to go into social services or something like that. Um, I'm completely neutral on that. that. That is strictly a matter of your personal choices. It's not like you've made some commitment to the IT industry. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, and so, uh, but when somebody has made a permanent lifelong commitment to somebody, it carries ethical weight in my, my view. It carries ethical weight. And part of that weight is, have you, have, you, have you done what you can? Have you made a fully serious effort? Have you gone around the track the extra time to see if it's possible to have this relationship survive and you still have, um, you know, personal joy in life. That's the stance I bring. I, you know, I sometimes love to label that a marriage friendly stance or, or what I think of as a, what a balanced pro commitment stance. Um, and, and that means that I'm sometimes going to challenge certain um, things that, things that people say that I think are, um, not good for them and not good for the marriage. So, uh, for instance, uh, if, if somebody is uh, thinking of leaving their marriage without understanding their own contributions to the problems, I think that's a, that's a big mistake. Um, uh, and I'll say to people, you know, you can't divorce yourself. Okay. You, you're going to bring your, your, your problems into the next relationship. Right. Um, you know, Carl Whitaker uh, was, was uh, famously quoted as saying that nobody should divorce until they figured out why they married this person to begin with and why they're thinking of divorcing them now. <laughs> right. Okay. right. Um, he would never say that ab- about somebody deciding to leave a job or to move to a different part of the country. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, the, that's the kind of uh, value stance I bring. And then, of course, the challenge is to be a good therapist knowing I have that value stance. Um, uh, you know, and that means I don't impose on people. I don't, I don't lecture them. I don't shame or guilt them if they don't go along with that. Um, and for any of your listeners who think, well, this is sort of dangerous territory, um, I, I, I th- think about when we work with parents and parents who are just sort of feeling like they, they just, they don't have it anymore to help, help this kid. You know, they're just overwhelmed. Well, we know we want to help the parent get their morale back and their hope back and to hang in there with their kid. Okay. Uh, we, we know that if we're dealing with parents in a divorce who are bad mouthing each other and triangling the kid in, well, we know we're going to do everything we can 
to get that, those parents to stop doing that because we have an ethical responsibility to their children, right? So what I'm saying is we, uh, there, there are situations in which we know we bring a value position. Uh, if, if we're dealing with an individual client who, who is abusing somebody, we know part of our job is to help them learn to not do that, to respect this other person, right? We've, we've no problem um, with having a value stance in those regards. When it comes to marriage and divorce, uh, some of the very same therapists who are very clear about values in terms of children's needs and abusive uh, adult clients uh, freeze when it comes to bringing a value orientation to a marital relationship situation. And I'm saying we don't have to freeze because I trust that those therapists know how to work with those parents, they know how to work with that abusive adult in a therapeutic way, in a therapeutic way. Uh, and we can work with people on the brink of divorce in a therapeutic way, having a value orientation that leans towards the marriage if it's possible. Right. I love that. I love that. And what would you say to um, a therapist taking a stance, something like, sure, you guys can get divorced, but um, I'm going to teach you some skills and how to communicate with each other. You're, you're each going to work on yourselves as individuals. You are going to learn how to communicate a lot better. And if you still feel like getting divorced after a certain time, then of course you can. But are you... Well, this is part of, I mean, I think, I don't, I haven't done that much training with it, but I think this is part of the conversation and discernment counseling almost, but it's like, you, you're telling them, sure, you can get divorced, but let's take a look at what's going on in the relationship before we, before you make that decision. Yeah. So this is what discernment counseling is about is a, uh, is a period of time, one to five sessions, no more than five <clears throat> to uh, develop clarity about what's happened, um, uh, uh, clarity about a direction you might want to take, confidence in that. So we talk about clarity and confidence about a direction for your relationship based on a deeper understanding of what's happened to your marriage and each person's contributions to the problems. Clarity, confidence based on this deeper understanding. Uh, and then we, we talk about three paths you can take. Path one is to go on as you've been, neither do therapy nor divorce. Path two is the separation and divorce path. And path three is a commitment to six months of couples therapy with divorce off the table and with a very clear agenda of what each person is going to work on uh, and then see where you are at that point. So a full throttle couples therapy. Uh, discernment counseling is, is designed to avoid half-hearted couples therapy. So the, the only th correction I'd make in terms of discernment counseling to what you said, Shane, is that you usually have in a divorce possible situation, a leaning out person and a leaning in person. The leaning out person is, is usually ambivalent about even trying to work on the marriage. Okay. That, so there's, they're uncertain about the marriage, they're uncertain about the, about the, the counseling that you're offering. And so if you try to teach them some communication skills with an unmotivated, ambivalent, leaning out person, they're apt to sabotage it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, or just not be into it. Or if the leaning in spouse doesn't do it well enough, okay, they aren't a good enough student of what you're teaching, then the leaning out one can use that as more evidence that this, this, this marriage is hopeless. So in discernment counseling, we don't do any couple interventions. We teach nothing. We do no enactments. We don't teach them how to communicate. We don't work on problems. We, uh, we, it's a holding environment. It's a pre-therapy environment. And most of the time they come in together, but most of the time is talking to each person separately because they each are on a different trajectory here. One is it needs to decide whether to try. And they often need help in seeing that they've been part of the problem because they're usually saying the problem is their spouse. And we do that with them separately. Then we have the leaning in spouse talking to them separately to really hear what their partner has been saying. I mean, to, to, to take in the pain that their spouse is in. 
not just to argue with them about it, to do an inventory of what they've contributed to the problems, and then to bring their best, their best self to the crisis, you know, so that they're not pursuing, they're not scolding, they're not doing all the things that, that people do when they feel like they're being rejected and that divorce is on the table. But we very carefully say, this is not couples therapy. We're not going to teach you to do anything different as a couple. And can you see the reason for that is that the commitment decision is up for grabs, including the commitment to try. And so if you start doing any interventions before the leaning out spouse is on board for interventions, they're likely to fail. Yeah, that's great because I'm sure we can all think of clients we've worked with where we 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 just start working with them assuming that they want their relationship to work you know which is assuming that we understand their goals for themselves instead of actually getting really clear with them about what they want first and getting you know and hopefully leading up to what you're talking about getting that buy in to actually work on it right exactly and um and when you have what i what we call mixed agenda couples okay so when you're even saying they they're there's two people and they're hardly ever in the identical position, okay? Right. <clears throat> uh, somebody's usually ahead of the other. Just at, at the beginning of relationships, usually somebody is, is, is further out ahead in wanting a commitment, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then there's this sort of jockeying, right? Um, well, at the end, well, when marriages are in trouble and they're on the brink, uh, and there's lots of research data on this, there is, almost always somebody further out the door than the other. There's a leaning in and a leaning out. Those are the terms we use, okay? And couples therapy, our models, and this, <clears throat> this is a golden age for couples therapy because we've got some great models and great training, much more so than when I started out. Mm -hmm. But the models are all based on the assumption that both people are there to give this a try. Okay. Yeah, that's such a great like point. Two customers for the therapy. Not, not that there's no ambivalence, but like, yeah, let, let's go for it here. Um, and that it's, it's fine because when you're doing your research study on your new model, that's who you want in your study. You don't want people who have the divorce lawyer on speed dial and who are willing to come once <clears throat> to see if you're offering anything. Uh, and so, <clears throat> so, so discernment, so, uh, it, it, divorce is never, almost never a collaborative decision. Uh, I, I, I work mostly now with couples on the brink of divorce and I'm trying to think of one, I can't think of one couple who got there at the same time. You know, like set, sit down at the kitchen table. Hey, so what do you think? Should we break up? I've been thinking the same thing. Let's do it, okay? Um, somebody is usually out ahead and, and somebody is reluctant. And so you have somebody who wants to try in therapy and the other person isn't sure they want to try at all. And, uh, and those couples, so it, it's a common presentation and most of us are on our own because we don't have, we don't have an explicit way to, 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 to deal with this kind of couple. So what, what, what I teach therapists is to assess, actually it's best on the phone beforehand if you can, but if you're in the first session with them, uh, and the, so there's a question that I, that I pose to couples. Um, if, if, if it isn't clear when you ask them why they're here, what, the, what they hope to get out of seeing you, you know, a standard question. Sometimes they both say right then, yeah, I mean, you know, I love this person. I want this to work out. We're in trouble, blah, blah, blah. But if, if they're not saying, if you're not clear within the first 10 or 15 minutes of the session, then I ask a question like this. I'd like to, to hear from each of you where you are right now in terms of your motivation to work on the problems that you have so that you could stay together and have a, have a good marriage or not so sure you have the motivation to work on the problems right now so you can stay together. Uh, and then if anybody says, yeah, I'm not so sure, I, you know, I, 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 we've had therapy before. I don't know if anything's going to change. I, I, you know, I came because my spouse asked me to. Then what I say is, <clears throat> I'm really glad you said that. I'm really glad that you straight up said you're not so sure about this. 
Okay, you're not so sure how much energy and motivation you have to work on the problems. And usually the other person is, you know, not happy about that because they're there to really work on them. And then I say, so I'd like to make a suggestion about how we proceed. Uh, and that we proceed with something I call discernment counseling instead of proceeding right with couples therapy. Because when somebody is as honest as you've been, always crediting them now, right? Uh, with you're not so sure you're ready to plunge in and work hard on, on the marriage right now because of the, you know, whatever. Um, and then I describe what this other process would be. That's great. You, uh, it sounds like that would be very disarming for the leaning out partner, you know, to, to actually feel heard and validated. And um, you're encouraging, you're setting a precedent for honesty and you're not going to, you're not going to move forward with working on the relationship until they're really ready for it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And they're not disappointing me. That's right. They're not disappointing yeah. me. So they can actually more fully own their decision when they actually decide to work right. on it. Yeah. Right. And then even in discernment counseling, uh, if, if somebody leaps to what I think is too fast to decide they are going to work on the marriage, they, they want this path three, the six months of therapy, I tell them to slow down. I mean, I never accept a decision after one discernment session to, to start the therapy. Never. I want, to, I want them to think about this. And in fact, in discernment counseling, before we launch what we call this path three, each person develops a personal agenda for change in writing that they share with their spouse. And then they sign a contract, an agreement of, of what, they're gonna, what they're gonna be committed to for the next six months to work on the relationship. So we kind of build, instead of stumbling half-heartedly into couples therapy with, with a reluctant uh, client, uh, we back up, uh, honor the ambivalence, see if they can work through it, uh, and then start couples therapy. Or they decide to divorce, and then we try to help them with, with um, having a constructive divorce and good referrals, or they decide neither. Because I'd rather, I'd rather them, I'd rather not start the couples therapy now and have them just go on as they've been rather than have a failed couples therapy. These are people on the brink of divorce. Some of them have had couples therapy before, over half had. This may be their last shot at it. And if they're not on board to really give it a full chance if they both aren't it's better to slow down at this point rather than pull the trigger and start the therapy and again no blame in anybody every just accepting where everybody is that's great that and that's a great point you just made as far as um just helping them have more clarity even if they aren't ready to start the therapy process or get or ready to get divorced you can say look you know the three options now Sounds like you need to take your time a little bit more just staying where you're at, but um, you're sort of, uh, get, it's more clarity about their ambivalence in the situation, mm -hmm. I guess. Yep, yep, yep. And <clears throat> success is not just what direction they go. It, success is that they both have learned something about their marriage. They've learned their patterns, their dances in the marriage, and they've learned their individual contributions to the problems. That, that's, what, that's what's happening. They, they're the, the, in the individual conversations, they're learning about themselves in the relationship. And so even if they divorce, they, our hope is that they have learned something uh, that they can bring to their next relationship. Well, this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, any, any final thoughts about anything we, ha we haven't mentioned so far? Uh, in the last couple of minutes here? Well, just if I can do a pitch for um, discernment counseling. Absolutely. Um, because we, it's, the training is all online uh, and people can join a kind of a community of discernment counselors. Uh, once you get trained in it and you get certified, you can advertise on your website that you do this. And so as the word gets out around the country that discernment counseling is offered, uh, we have lawyers and others who refer specifically for discernment counseling. Um, and, and so people, people are beginning to see this as an option that is not just divorce or not just, uh, you know, long-term couples therapy, but a kind of holding pattern to evaluate a direction. So uh, uh, discernmentcounseling.com uh, mm -hmm. and, and people can get online training um, in it if they like. 
Great. And if, if I'm a therapist who's interested and I, and I sign up, uh, what does that look like? What would my experience be as far as well, like it's, all self, it's all self-paced mm-hmm. online training. So you can do it at your own pace. Uh, lots of cases, lots of, uh, um, lots of the particulars. It's really a, it's a, it's a full protocol, one to five sessions that has a lot of nuance in it. Uh, and, um, and the people who do it really, uh, really enjoy it. You're working with couples really at a crucible point in in their lives with a definite plan as opposed to kind of what a lot of us have done is sort of well let's try some therapy you know yeah Um, and or and this just we go back to where we began what some even couples therapists do when they see these leaning in leaning out couples they declare hopelessness so we've had couples see us who with their couples therapists has said i can't do anything for you you know, doesn't look like, look like you're going to make it because you're not in agreement about whether to try. So the two mistakes couples a therapist makes are either give up and kind of implicitly or explicitly pronounce them as dead on arrival or try to talk them into starting the therapy with somebody not on board. Those are the two mistakes. I've made both of those mistakes, by the way, giving up or pursuing the distance or leaning out. And, and it, it's not a pretty picture. Right. Uh, th- this this is a, w- a systematic way to offer people something when they're they're stuck and they're divided about where to go, and it's it's great fun. I enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. Well, yeah, I think we we all see we all have experiences with these kind of couples on some level, and this sounds like something that would be beneficial for any couples therapist to uh, do the training for sure. Hey. Um, so what, how, how else can people find out more about you or get in touch with you? Uh, is discernmentcounseling.com the best place or anywhere sure, else? That's, that that's a good place to start. Yeah. I, you know, my daughter, who is a, a couples therapist, uh, does this with me. So we have a little family business called the Doherty Relationship Institute uh, that she's the president of. Uh, and, um, and so she, and, you know, she kind of r- runs that and I've, I've done a lot of the, you know, I've, I've developed all the online modules. So, and it's a, you know, it's a little community of discernment counselors, uh, that would, that we've created. Oh, that's great. Great. Well, thank you again so much for being on the show, Bill. Hopefully we can uh, catch up at, again at some point in the future. I, I had a good time. I appreciate the interview, Shane. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.